Okay. So the example here is a rather old one that looks at attitudes towards police, perhaps one that's relatively timely given our current issues with policing and Black Lives Matter. And the researchers here looked at three factors that are related to policing, service, the response time, uh, and the nature of the response that they have, policemen's courtesy, honesty, and equal treatment of people, and police's responses to burglary, vandalism, and robbery. And this is a picture of the path diagram that results there. If we're looking at this in terms of an M plus model, this is what it looks like. A few things to notice here. You'll notice at the beginning, I've put in a little bit of code here. Inside of M plus comments begin with an exclamation point. And what I've done here is just to make a small ruler. So physically what you do is you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, and you keep doing that for a while. And the reason that I do that is inside of M plus, it's kind of an old compiler and it's based on Fortran and they bought the rights to it. And as that Fortran compiler goes, it is expecting text input, the text input that relates to computer cards. And for that reason, you can't go out as much as you'd like as you can with SAS or R. You have to stop at column 73. So this little ruler here is just to keep me honest to make sure I never start writing text outside of that. To rehearse a little bit of the language of M plus, it's a line by line model. I can put a title in and here's some files. If I'm not analyzing raw data, but I'm telling M plus, here's the summary statistics, I need to have this line in that says the type is correlation and I have means and standard deviation. So this, if we take a look at this MacGyver.txt file, be in the right place. This is what it looks like. So my first row has means, my second row has variances, and my third row is my correlation matrix in triangular form. If you are inputting summary data, you also have to have the sample sizes. So you'll have to say how many observations are present. And when you're inputting summary statistics, it's assuming that you have no missing data. There's no way to put in the number of observations and the coincidence pattern for the various variables in terms of their missingness. Downstairs, we now say, what are the variables in my study? And then I specify the model. So in this case, I want to specify three factors. And as I mentioned before, the default behavior of M plus and many programs is to assume that the first, loadings, uh, the first loading is fixed as a referent loading and that that is fixed at the number one. If I want to override that, I have to have this asterisk here to say this is a free value. The next thing is to specify the variances of the three latent variables and the variances of conditional variances, that is the error variances of the manifest variables. Downstairs, for completeness's sake, this specifies the means of the manifest variables. And finally, that the means of all the latent variables are zero. And the way I've set this up is I'm going to say the mean is in the model. I want you to generate some numbers for me. I want to do maximum likelihood estimation. 
I want to see the standardized values. I would like to take a look at the confidence intervals for all the parameters in my model. And the tech three and tech one are going to give me the iteration history and where the fixed and free models are in my data. And I would also like to take a look at the sample statistics that I have. So that's the syntax. Are there any questions about that? I have a quick question. Yeah. Why did you decide to free the false variables? Entirely arbitrary. The only reason I did that is it, it makes it easy for me to look at the correlations between the factors, that the covariances between the factors as being correlations. There's absolutely no reason, and we can quickly run the model the other way and play around with that as well. So let's put a pin in it, and I'll do it later, and you'll see you get the same darn numbers out. Okay, second question. Um, the, what, what is the F1 at one? What are, are you just okay. handed? Okay, the at says that this is a fixed value and the one is the value that it's fixed at. So this little line is saying the variance of the first factor is fixed at the number one. Okay, thank you. Yep. To follow up, to follow up on, on that question, why- This is great, people are talking. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So why is it set to one for the variance F1 for F2, F3, while we have already set uh, Polyserve, Hanesty, and Bulgari? Well, Polyserve is free. So that's a free oh. parameter. So, this, so this, the stars means free? free. The star means it's free, yeah. Mm -hmm. The star means it's free, and the at means that it's fixed. Oh, OK. Right. So downstairs, I'm saying the mean is fixed at zero. So by the way, if we decided to uh, set the policy F as one, then mm -hmm. we have to make F1 free, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. We can't do both. And because in this model, we just have three factors and they're all exogenous, I can specify the model fixing the variance to one. Anything uh, else? Yeah. Another question. So, in terms of naming the um, the Latin construct F one, F two, F three, um, is there any like uh, guidance how to name this the, the Latin construct if we get this manifest variable first and then we would like to name the Latin? In, inside of M plus, you can name them anything you would like. You could, for example, come upstairs and name these these latent variables service, ICE. And then downstairs, you'd have to also then name this service and come downstairs and name this service, but that would all work. I, I mean, in terms oh. of naming the Latin variable, it doesn't matter what, what name we would like. No, huh. not at all. And cat, it's agnostic, M plus, uh, as distinct from Levon is agnostic about capitalization. So you can use upper or lower case. Um, so let's run this and take a look at what we have. And here's our printout. Um, The first thing that M plus does is it echoes back to you all this text and your model. And if we've made any mistakes, it's going to, that's going to appear down here. We generated a warning. It's just saying, oh, by the way, I'm always going to be thinking about mean structure in the model, it's the default. And if I didn't want mean structure in the model, we'd have to say model is no mean structure. You can also run that and take a look at it. It's the same thing. Downstairs, how many groups do we have? We're only analyzing a single group. If we were analyzing males and females, we'd have two groups. And how many observations do we have? How many dependent variables? We've got nine manifests. And we have three latent variables. We don't have any independent variables pointing at anything in the model. So that's why that's a zero. Here's my dependent variables. And here's my continuous latent variables. I'm doing maximum likelihood. My default number of iterations is 1,000. And you won't spend much time looking at this unless your model hasn't converged. Here's the convergence criterion. That is the 
difference between this iteration's values and the previous iteration's values. So it's three zeros and point, 0 0.5. Where did I go to get the data? The input format is free. So if, for example, your data set had specific columns that read you know, where the data are, you would write a format statement. There's guidance in the M plus manual, which is freely available. You can download it from statmodel.com. It'll give you, you know, that if you are in the shape of needing to have something that's fixed format. And then M plus echoes back for you the, the summary statistics. And this is good practice because, you know, if you're reading in an Excel file or a text file, maybe the data don't match. You know, maybe some error was made in reading things in. These are summary statistics that I input as I showed you. So it's echoing back for me the numbers that I have. I terminated normally. This is good. That means I converged. If the model didn't converge, it would give me a little message saying maximum number of iterations exceeded. How many free parameters do I have in my model? 30. So how did we get to 30? Well, we'll count that up in a moment. Here's my likelihood value. And these are the fit statistics we were talking about before. So the first thing to look at here is, you know, the BIC is a number that we, I might use if I were comparing models that are not nested. Again, just to echo what's in the handout, there's no real way to interpret that number. If somebody tells you, oh, you have to have values of the BIC less than 1,000 for your model to be fit, you know they're lying to you because this BIC value is dependent on how many variables you have in the study, their variances, and so forth. Downstairs is the chi-square fit with 24 degrees of freedom. And this is a measure of badness of fit. So the fact that this is statistically significant tells us, oh, well, these data do not meet the assumptions of being conditionally normal. Here's our RMSEA, O2, and the confidence interval going from O2 to O3. So in terms of goodness of fit, you'd say, even though the chi-square is significant here, and I would normally think, oh, that's not very good, I have so many people in my study, 11,000, that the significance is perhaps you know, giving me information that, oh, things are not conditionally normal. Viewed as, in terms of the RMSEA, this is a really great model. And based on this, RMSEA less than 05, it's pretty sure that it's less than 05 in terms of a cutoff. The other things I thought you might want to take a look at are the TLI and the CFI. Generally speaking, these two numbers are going to be pretty similar. And in terms of fit, 0.99 is an excellent fit. Remember that the CFI and the TLI are based on a comparison between the model you have and the independence null. The independence null, that is the model that says there's variances for your manifest variable, but no covariances, that chi-square is 24,000 with 36 degrees of freedom. And the standardized root mean square residual, as we talk about, is also a very small number. So based on this, kind of speaking slowly on a Wednesday morning at eight o'clock, even though the chi-square is significant, for this model, the rest of the fit indices indicate an excellent fit. Any questions? So the reason why p-value is so small is because of the number of observation in the data? Well, the reason that the chi-square is so large and the p-value is so value small, is yeah, small. right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that generally speaking with real world data, with a large sample, you are going to observe a significant chi-square. Okay. But we report that in our research because it's good to know the chi-square value because 
you can calculate other fit statistics based on that. So to walk through our printout here, here are the unstandardized factor loadings. Now, let me be clear on this, that if you are looking at variables that all have different scales, and perhaps these items do, you would not report the unstandardized factor results, structural modeling results, because the variance of, say, police service and response might be different. In this example, I'm only, I only have the correlation matrix to work with. So my unstandardized and standardized values will look very similar. But in practice, if you are looking at a factor model with variables in different scales, you would be looking at the standardized and reporting the standardized solution. And the reason for that is you're interested in looking at proportions of unique variance and the relative strength of association. On the other hand, if you are looking at a growth model, looking at something that will predict maybe who gets the 4.0 or who is more likely to earn more than $50,000 in a year, then you would be interested in looking at the unstandardized solutions. So inside of this, here's my uns unstandardized value. This is the standard error. So based on this, 0.74 is my guess for the unstandardized loadings. And the standard deviation I estimate if I were to keep doing my study over and over again is 0.01. So upon replication, this number is probably going to stay at 0.7. It might dip down to 0.72 and it might go up to 0.76, but I wouldn't expect much variation on that. This number, the loading, divided by its standard error, gives me the wall test. So this is an approximate Z of 73, which is significant at the OOGs level. And the p-value is correspondingly very small. Downstairs, because my variances are one, these sling values, these covariances, may be interpreted as correlations. So I see that factor one and factor two, having honesty, courteous, and so forth, policemen, and having a good response time and the overall rating of value, those two variables seem to be correlated quite a bit. However, those variables are correlated negatively with that last one of response to you know, reports of burglary and violence. Whenever I fix a value, remember I fix the means of the latent variables to be zero, it's gonna give me 999s here. That's not a test, it's just a reflection of the constraints that are present in the model. Here are my manifest variable intercepts. Remember we read in only, only zeros for the data, so that's why these appear, but you know, that's why you see zero and 0.01 and zero here. If I had raw data, I would have real numbers here. And downstairs, here are my error variances. What follows are the standardized values. Well, these are going to look, as I mentioned before, very, very similar to the unstandardized values because all I did was read in a correlation matrix. But the parameter estimates, the standard errors, and the wall step tests have the same interpretation as before. Okay. Now, inside of M plus, one thing that's an advantage of M plus, and for when you're just getting used to it, it's a little confusing, is M plus gives you a lot of different standardized solutions. I'm gonna give you an easy recommendation at the moment. The thing you need to pay attention to is the standardized Y X value. And the reason for that is, in your models, all Y variables, all independent variables, and all dependent variables are standardized to a variance of one and mu of zero. These other ones that follow, like the STD Y value, 
are more appropriate for more comp for different types of models, such as multi-level models, where for reasons of analysis, we're interested in standardizing only the independent variables, but not the dependent variables. And you know, those are not models that we'll cover in this class. I cover them in the next one. But for the moment, you know, this is the one you want to look at. Levon also does this. And you know, the STDYX standardization is what you want to report. All right. So down here at the bottom, we have an R square for each model. So this tells you the proportion of variance in each of the manifest variables that is accounted for in the model. Well, what is this 0.55? It is, using the tracing rules, the proportion of variance in the first manifest variable due to the structural model. So going up here, 0.74 times the variance of the factor one times 0.74 is going to give me 0.55. And the same thing applies to all the rest of them. This estimate can also have a standard error. That is, how much will it jump around upon replication? And I can have a wall test. So this part of the printout is answering the question, for which manifest variables have I explained a statistically significant proportion of the variance? Generally speaking, when you publish your results, you would show the diagram with the standardized estimates and you'd be done. I've not come up against many cases where it was really important to talk about the R square, but for completeness, this is what it is and this is what it's doing for you. So the next little bit of information down here is perhaps of interest to only me. I've never really found it to be, you know, found it to be a case where I could say, oh, well, here's your, here's your issue. That if I specified a model and extracted a lot of eigenvalues, the ratio of the first eigenvalue to the last eigenvalue is kind of an, an indication of how highly collinear variables are. Uh, and when we talk about exploratory factor analysis, I'll talk, of, talk about exactly what eigenvalues they're talking about. But happily for Wednesday morning, you can more or less ignore this. That's not going to be anything you'll pay attention to. This part is a little bit more interesting to you, and it concerns the confidence intervals. Now, in terms of APA publications, very frequently we, they say don't only report the estimate that you have, but report the 95% confidence intervals or the 99% confidence intervals on your data. So you might, you know report this 0 0.72 open parenthesis 0 0.722 and 0 0.762 as giving the range of values. And that follows for all of the things in your model. This is for the unstandardized solution. And then after that, they do the same thing for your standardized solution. Questions on this? Um, when, when, can you repeat again? When do we report the standardized and when do we report the standardized? Okay. Yeah. So for, I would say all of the times where you're doing a confirmatory factor model, well, as I think about it, perhaps there's an exception here if you're looking at multi-group models, but if you're doing a single group, you would report the standardized solution. If you're looking at growth or change over the course of time, though, the standardized solution doesn't really make a lot of sense. So just to give an example, if I'm looking at a study where I have time one, time two, time three, and I want to say, well, how are people changing? Are people, is the population becoming more variable over the course of time? 
the standardized solution isn't going to tell me what I want to know because the standardized solution is going to come in and say, everything has a mean of zero and a variance of one. So at time one, mean zero variance of one, like time two, mean zero variance of one, time three, mean zero variance of one. So the standardized solution subtracts out exactly that mean information that I might be interested in. So you know, if you're looking at growth, and now to amend that a little bit, if you're looking at multi-group models and you want to say, oh, well, you know what? Women are much more conscientious than men. They show up for class more often. Then you, know, you might want to report the unstandardized solution for that as well. Okay. All right. And, okay. Now what follows is a little bit of matrix algebra. When you're doing M plus, you need to keep track of what M plus is doing in terms of its free and fixed parameters. So let's just walk through these things here. New are the intercepts of the manifest variables. So in here, this is my guess of the mean for all of my manifest variables. The next thing is the lambda matrix, and that tells me what the free parameters are that relate latent variables to manifest variables. So in this, I can see it's, get, it's costing me nine degrees of freedom to estimate all these means. And then downstairs, I'm estimating a mean here, a mean here, and a mean here, and a mean here, a mean here, sorry, not a mean, a loading here, loading here, loading here, and a loading here, loading here, loading here, and so forth. If I, or when we, rerun this model and fix the first loading to one, you're going to see a zero here, and a zero here, and a zero here. Theta is the matrix of variances and covariances of errors. So in this model, I'm assuming that each of, my each of my manifest variables has an error term. If there would be a covariance, you know, that would be indicated by some number other than zero here. Alpha are the means of my latent variables. I set, fixed them all to zero, so that's why those are not free parameters. Beta are arrows from a latent variable to another latent variable. Well, this model doesn't have any of those. So that's why those are all zeros because we only had slings between our latents. And downstairs, psi is the matrix of variances and covariances of the latent variables. Well, I fixed the variance of factor one, factor two, and factor three to be one. So that's why those are not free parameters, but I am freely estimating all of the variances and covariances. So again, just to come back and rehearse, new manifest variable intercepts, lambda factor loadings, theta error variances, alpha factor means, beta paths from latents to latents, and psi variances and covariances of latents. The next thing that you see are the starting values that M plus used. And it does something called two-stage least squares often to arrive at these starting values. You generally don't care about these. You can specify start values for particular loadings if you want to. If, for example, you start ending up with negative loadings across all indicators of a factor and you'd like to see positive ones, but you know, generally speaking, this is just here for your edification. The tech three output is something that I put in just to show you what's going on. Remember, inside of regression, when we were looking at factor loadings, there was this thing called the matrix C, which is the variance covariance estimate of the parameters. So in cases of Redundancy, for example, my guess for one regression weight is negatively correlated with my guess for another regression weight. In cases of suppression, they're both positively correlated. 
Well, what you see here is estimates of the variance of each of the parameters in the model. The first loadings, I'm sorry, in this case, the first nine are going to be the means in the model. And after that, the ind individual loadings. And after that, I will see the correlations. So to the extent that some of my parameters are correlated with others of them, I am going to see correlation matrices here. <clears throat> so for example, for this first loading, 10, and the second loading, 09, those two parameters are correlated in their estimation. This is not something that you would report. This is something that you might look at to gain an understanding of why, where some parameter estimates might be related to others of them, and where in your model, some parameter estimates are not at all related to other things. And it then tells you when it started and when it finished and how long it took. It's always a little dicey to do things uh, on, you know, interactively, but M plus also has a diagrammer and it will show you the path diagram it has. And lo and behold, you, you know, here's your diagram. There are ways to rotate this view. Uh, you can copy and paste this in the model. And you can say, please show me the standardized estimates. And you, know, you can then copy and paste this diagram into your manuscript. So that's a little kind of nice. We're at 841. So what I want to do is to come back to the diagram. Excuse me. I hope I don't mess things up here. There we go. And to run the model with another type of specification. So we said we could take these stars off, or we could alternatively say at one. And then come downstairs and free those variances. And rerun the model. And you'll see you get exactly the same numbers out as you had before. It's just that now my first loading is six to one. And my factor variances down here are free. My covariances are no longer correlations. For that reason, if I want to know how correlated these factors are, I need to come downstairs and again, look at the correlated solution here. Okay. Is that working for you? Yep. Okay. So inside of the handout, I did exactly what we're looking at here. In terms of what goes on in this chapter, is that drawing that three factor correlated model is only one of many alternatives you could have. I could specify uncorrelated factors by fixing the covariances of the factors to be zero. The model that I showed you here was correlated factors. And there are other models called bi-factor, hierarchical, multi-trait, multi-method, state-trait models, and so forth. So inside of this, I again you know, wanted to do more than three indicators for each factor for reasons that I'll talk about later on in the chapter. But I have three factors that are all related to reasons for drinking, social conformity and enhancement. And if I were wanting to look at an orthogonal structure, this is the path diagram I would draw. And as mentioned before, I could either identify this model by fixing the variance to one and freely estimating that's a little bit nicer when you write up the report because for each of your loadings, you can say, oh, I'm this loading significant and that one and that one and that one. And if you fix one loading to one, sometimes reviewers will say, well, how do you know that that loading was significant? Um, 
If, however, this is, these factors were endogenous, you have to settle out into one to get an identified solution. If I fit a model that says there's no covariance between these three things, these are the loadings I get out, and these are the error variances. Conversely, if I fit a loading in which there are slings there, these are the loadings I get out, and these are the error variances. Downstairs, here are the correlations between the factors in the model that says that this is oblique. So based on this, factor one and factor three are highly correlated. And factor one and two and two and three are not so correlated. So people who drink because of the social aspect of it and drink because of enhancement, those factors are fairly correlated. People who drink just to get along into the group to be liked and because of Facebook, that, that's not so related with reasons for drinking. So in terms of path diagrams, this is what it looks like. Now I use the term here, simple structure. And I do so for a reason because simple structure is also something that we talk about in exploratory factor analysis. This means nothing more than the fact that each of the loadings in my model, each of the variables in my model, have loadings on only one latent variable. It's possible to consider a model that does not have simple structure. That is a model in which a given item loads on one factor, but also loads on the other. And when you do that, well, now these individual, you know, these more complex loadings will, when they're estimated, start to affect the values that you will have for the degree to which factors are correlated. Now, you could just as well say, maybe there is no correlation at all here, but that this factor also has individual loadings and in all the rest of the items. That's not a very parsimonious model, is it? Conversely, though, if you're going to be skeptical of your model, you could say, well, you said there's a correlation here. Maybe that correlation would go away if I just let this factor have one more path in the model. So it's a way of thinking about how to be skeptical of how to kick the tires on your model. So is this working for you? Well, we have a few moments, so let's go on to the next one. Bi-factor models are an alternative to these simple structure models. And in a bi-factor model, it's sort of like you have one factor to rule them all, and one general factor. And then I'll have little individual factors downstairs here. Sometimes, for example, if you're looking at psychopathology, there's something people call the P factor. That is, there's one factor that seems to be associated with all of the diagnoses that you have. Or, you know, since Mary is here, if you're studying mathematical achievement, there is a general numeracy factor. And perhaps there are factors that relate to subcomponents of the items. You know, maybe some items have to do with how people add or carry the ones or how people might multiply or how people visuospatially think about their data. And those subfactors might explain some additional variance between other common items in that subset in addition to this general factor. So the bi-factor model is an example of some model that does not show simple structure. It shows a hierarchical structure in that there's one general factor to rule them all. Within the field of economics or public policy, you know, there's, there may be, all well be a general factor of economic advantage or disadvantage or you know, systemic racism that would explain a lot of the co-variation in the data. You know, how you name that variable sort of becomes your job, whatever that circle is. But if there are general associations present in the data, maybe there's only little clusters downstairs and these clusters are not related to each other. 
if I fit a bifactor model to the data, this is what my numbers look like. It tries to extract one general factor, this one up here, for all of the items. So as we see, gee, you know, those really look very, very nice, very nice loadings, conformity, very low loadings. And the last one, we have some very nice loadings on enhancement. So that bifactor model is doing the job of extracting that correlation between the social and the enhancement factors. And then after that, we have our little baby factors, these things down here. Well, after I extract that general factor, I've only got very small loadings on the enhancement factor. The conformity factor, the thing that did not seem to be related to social or enhancement reasons, those loadings are very high. And downstairs here on enhancement, I've got another set of loadings so that you know it seems like there exists an enhancement factor above and beyond whatever this global factor is. And then downstairs, I have the error terms. I think what I'll do is stop here and have office hours. And what we'll do is we'll continue looking at hierarchical factor models. From the feedback and the fact that people are talking and asking questions, it seems like a good way to go through this chapter is to do part talking out of the handout and then part going through an analysis using some software platform. Is that kind of how you want to do things? Oh, I see a chat here. Yes, to everyone. Okay. All right, let's call it a day then. Enjoy the beautiful fall day. The wild persimmons are on the trees. I went out and picked a few. Uh, they're very nice. I'll have office hours here now. And other than that, I'll see you come Friday. Dr. Wood, would you be able to go through an example, either like maybe next class of when the model doesn't converge on a conformatory factor analysis and how we can kind of step by step go through yep. <laughs> like how we can handle that? Because I anticipate if our you know homework is going to be using our own data, I, I don't trust that mine's going to maybe look so great. Well, you know what you I mean, I'm happy to try to do that. The the thing that happens that's really kind of the best is as people work on their projects, I usually kick off the class by saying, let's take 15, 20 minutes and go through what's not working for you today. <laughs> but and because it's at that, it's at that point that, you know, sometimes when things don't converge, the person made a mistake in specifying the model. For example, maybe they fixed a factor variance at one and a loading at one. And other times there are little twiddles that we can play with. But sure, I can I can kick it off with an example of something that doesn't work for you. But you know, I, I'm just saying you know the, the class opens up more and more as we go into those two-year projects and you getting messy and finding that your data doesn't behave like textbook examples. But sure. Thank you. Both of those things sound like okay. Like a good solution. <laughs> All right. All right, oh, there they all go. All right, yes. Oh, and then there was one. <laughs>